Again, we'd like to thank God tonight for another opportunity. I'd like to first start off with being apologetic for last night. We had so much technical difficulty with our internet service streaming going down. And so tonight I just want to be a, give a recap on what we discussed on last night in the book of Malachi chapter 2, beginning from verse 5 through verse 7. Uh, we will begin where he says, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherein he feareth me, and was afraid before my name. The Lord truth was in my mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did not turn men away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should see the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Again, right quickly, we just want to recap on yesterday where we talked about covenant relationship with God. And this covenant relationship with God is the same symbolic of God had covenant relationship with us. And this is not just some script on a piece of paper with a signature, but it's a blood covenant. In the Old Testament dispensation, they would cut each other. Maybe both person would cut their fingers, and then they would draw blood, and they would put one finger in hands of another, and that would be symbolic of a blood relationship. And that's the blood relationship that in Christ, when he came and died for our sins, he drew blood. But that blood covenant was a relationship with us, that he would be with us from time to eternity. Matthew says that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And so it is, it says that when we talked about the covenant relationship, John says that uh, he's gone away, but he's coming again to receive us unto ourselves, that where he is, we may be also. And so he gives four descriptive of covenant relationship. Remember that Hebrew word for covenant is berif. Uh, that for berif, that mean that mean cut with relationship of blood covenant. Berif. That's the Hebrew word, the covenant. And most of the time, we in covenant relationship with God, God will never leave us. We may leave God, but God will never leave us. He said, I'm with you always even to the end of, of the age. Whenever Israel, or whenever the Old Testament dispensation uh, had troubles and the inevitable came knocking on their door, uh, it was because they were uh, disobedient to God. They had gone away from God. They had broke the covenant uh, with God. We have to understand that when we are out of covenant relationship with God, we don't have what we usually have when we're in covenant relationship. When we have covenant relationship with God, we have the peace of God. We have the power of God. We have the uh, preeminence of God. Uh, we have the protection of God. Uh, we have the glory of God. We have all of that when covenant relationship with him. When we don't have covenant relationship, then we don't have the blessings of God. We don't have the favor of God. We don't have the protection of God. And so we have to make sure that we remain in covenant relationship with God because there are some things that come in covenant relationship. I never shall forget just a few uh, uh, years ago, I bought an air condition and the guy asked me did I wanna, did I wanna make sure that I got a lifetime warranty. And the lifetime warranty entered a covenant relationship that if I ever needed a compressor, a office to a dryer for the air condition, that all I have to do was was to bring it back. And they would give me my money back or give me a brand new one uh, to make sure that it would function properly. Uh, that's the way it is with God. When things go wrong with God and we get out of covenant relationship with God, all we have to do is just go back to God and God will restore us. He is a God, not of condemnation, but he's a God of reconciliation. And he's always willing and waiting to reconcile us when we come back to him if we just repent and ask God for forgiveness. And so he deals with the four parts of covenant relationship. Number one, he deals with number one when he says that we need to reference God. Uh, I said last night that when Moses uh, went 
uh, on the Mount Sinai that he was drawn by the burning bush that did not did not consume, uh, consuming that the bush uh, was on fire, but yet it was not consumed. And so he said to Moses, Moses, you have to recognize me that the ground you own is not just any type of ground, but the ground you own is holy ground. And my dear, when we go to church, the ground, we can't wait to get on the inside and talk about what is this holy ground. No, when you enter the ground, the ground that we're on is holy ground. We ought to watch how we talk, how we act, what kind of attitude we have, uh, what, what's going on in our life, the demeanor, before we enter into the sanctuary. Because he gives the principle about entering to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so just the very way are we, we ought to just clear our mind when we come into a reference of God that we reference him. And then not only, but in the sanctuary to how we act. Uh, that many times we have used to have meetings uh, going on in the temple of God. And when we go in the meeting, you'd be surprised at the things that people say when you don't have a reference of God. Well, you can't have a reference of God if you don't have a relationship with God. So the first thing is you are out of order even when you come on God's ground in God's house if you don't have a relationship with him because you have to have covenant relationship with God that we are committed to doing what God say doing because Father pleases, pleases and to make sure that we do that which is pleasing and exciting. And then not only how we act in the sanctuary, what kind of attitudes we have. Do we really see God who he really is? When we walk into the building, maybe we need to take the steeple sign off the building and put it in front of the door because it's a symbolic representation of the hope and salvation of man. And so we need to make sure that we reference that, that God is our only hope, that there's no other way that which we can be saved. No other way which our sins can forgive us. We can't work our way for forgiveness. We God, God merit that when he give us mercy and he give us that grace. And then the next thing is that deals with reverence him is how we do what we do. That whatever we do we ought to make sure that we do it unto the Lord. That we do it to please God. Whether nobody watching us or not. Somebody says character is what we are in the dog. And so when we have real character, then we do it to please, to please God. It's not about pleasing nobody else, but it's about pleasing God. I love the lyrics of the song that said, I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me as I think at Calvary, is my master satisfied with him and satisfied with me? And so basically what we have to do, we have to make sure that whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord to please him. That's the only way that we can give God honorable and reasonable service. So we have to sacrifice ourselves to make sure that we glorify God. And that's what the scripture says uh, when it says that we have to make sure that we what we do with God, present to him our reasonable service. Present your bodies, live in sacrifices, because that's the only way we can please God. And so we have to make sure that we reference him. That Hebrew word for reverence is moroah. Moroah that we mean we respect God's name. I know there's a lot of people doing comedy and there's a lot of people doing plays. But whatever we do, we should never get to the, to the stratosphere that we have a disrespect for God's name. That Hebrew word moroah that we make sure that we respect the name of God, and make sure that we don't use God's name in vain. Secondly, that we need to make sure that we know God's word. Uh, the word, uh, Psalms 119 talks about, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And so we know God's word, that the law of truth was in their mouth. Uh, remember God, beforehand God said that, that they would not, two problems that the priest had in the previous verses, he said, number one, they would not hear God's word. And number two, they would not hearken to God's word. The two principles behind relationship to that is that you can, if you don't hear God's word, and if you don't hearken to God's word, it's no way you can lead uh, his sheep in the way that's supposed to be led. He said to uh, Peter, feed my sheep, 
feed my sheep and then feed my lamb. And so you have to make sure that number one, you listen to the voice of God and then you hearken to the word of God. And that Hebrew word is Torah, that he gives whatever we need to do in relationship to uh, the Bible. Uh, many times people say, well, I'm not being fed. Well, uh, the church is to embrace you, not to feed you. It's to embrace you. If you're not being fed, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God, a work that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. You need to know if fish on Friday is about righteousness or not. Uh, you, need, you need to know that. Uh, you need to know you can't eat your way into righteousness. You need to know that. But you need to know the law of truth. What does the Bible really say in relationship to what is truth? Remember, it's not what you know that hurts you, but it's always what you don't know that hurts you. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so he said that the law of truth was in their mouth. In other words, there's nothing that's a lie that comes from the word of God. That's why Isaiah 55 and 11 says, is that his word shall not return void. It will do what it say it will do. It will be what it say it's going to be because his word shall not return void. Before one tittle or one jot of his word shall fail, heaven and earth will pass away. You need to know that you know, you know, you know that the law of truth is in the mouth of God. And God put his spirit into the mouth of mankind and to, and to the clergy that when we speak, the law of God ought to be in our mouth. Not, not what's on CNN, not what, what's going on in the Senate, not, not what's going on uh, in the House of Representatives, not, not what's going on anywhere else. But it has to be what's in the law of God. When people come to the church, they are not looking for what's going on in the world. They're looking for what does say the Lord. What does the Bible say? Not, not what society say, but what does the Bible say? And so we have to make sure that the Lord truth that we speak, it comes from the Bible. If any type of advice that you receive, if it doesn't come from the word, pitch it out. No. Our uh, uh, information and counseling from God should not come from our gut but it ought to come from the gospel. And so we have to make sure that we, whatever somebody tell us, according to whatever we go ask them, whatever we need strength from, it ought to come from the word of God. That the word of truth will come from their mouth. And then the third thing is he deals with godly character. Godly character deals with the praise and the equity in relationship. In other words, we have to not just hear the word, we we'll have to make sure there is application, but in application, that is principle. Yeah, we have to make sure that that is principle. In other words, the principle of the relationship to God is that we like to use the old uh, statement from uh, board meetings and how board meetings are written, talking about the robber rules of order and the majority rules. No, the majority don't rule. God is the majority. In other words, I don't care how many people that you may be ministering to or how many people that that may be against you. If you're connected with God and you're in a covenant relationship with God, you are the majority. You and God alone are the majority. Matter of fact, God don't need you to be the majority. It's just God himself. And so it's not about how many people are connected uh, together and have congregated together. It's not about how many people are there. But it's about what does the word of God say. But whatever the word of God say, it is true. That's the principle. That's the principle in relationship to it. Not the majority rules, but God rules. And then the next thing is the expectancy of God having a principle. We fall short in the body of Christ, not by reading the Bible, not by packing the Bible, not by quoting the Bible, but we fall short by application and principle. In other words, manage how we manage our lives, how we manage our lives. We can't blame God for our deficiencies in our, in our poverty. 
He said, I have come that they may have life and they have it more abundantly. So if, if you have a problem with God taking care of you and he is a father, then something has gone wrong. You must be out of covenant relationship with God. If you are faithful in the least, you'll be faithful in the much. And so the Bible talks about tithing. There are a lot of people believe in tithing, but it doesn't matter if you believe in tithing. That's the application. But the principle of tithing is bring the tithing to the storehouse and prove me therewith, said the Lord of hosts. And will I not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that there would not be room enough to receive them? That's the principle. The principle is what we have when we give God first. No, God don't need nothing. The Bible declares that the cattle of a thousand here belong to him. So we don't give God because he needs something. We give God because we need something. You don't go to the grocery store because the grocery store needs something. You go to the grocery store because you need something. You don't go get your car serviced because because you need something, you go to the grocery store because you need the service that they render unto you. We don't go to God and we don't give God because God needs something. We give to him because we need something and that's covenant relationship with God. That's the principle. Do you really think God can't make it? No, no, it's not that God, God wanted you the opportunity for you to pre, be faithful and loyal to him. We don't have that privilege with GMAC. If we don't pay, they take our car. The light company, we don't pay, they cut our lights off. The gas, we don't pay, they cut our gas off. The water, we don't pay, they cut our, God still blesses us even many times when we are disobedient. But don't think God won't, won't, won't correct us because God is a long-suffering God. He gives us opportunity to come to our senses because we apply the principle wrong. God needs something. Well, uh, the pastor want your money. Pastor don't need your money. You think God can take care, can't take care of the pastor? I wouldn't go nowhere depending on people. If I go somewhere, I'm going to depend on God. I think I need to say that again. I'm not going diddly squat depending on no people. I'm going dependent on God. God says that I will take care of you. If I go deal with people, people getting laid off, people won't go to work. I got to depend on people? No, I can depend on God. He will never get laid off. He's rich. Don't get it twisted. Whatever we have, it does not belong to us. It belongs to God. We are not owners. We are just managers. And if you think you own it, die and see where you take it with you. That house, who you cutting that grass for? Who you painting it for? Who you paying those notes for? Who you paying insurance and taxes? We are not owners. We are stewards. And God given us to manage. The next thing is covenant relationship with God. To walk worthy of God. Many times we deal with marriages and what's you know what's going on in society. It's not about what's happening in culture, but it's happening with, with Christ. What did God say? How does God relate in a family? Was man made for man? Or was woman for man? Did God create another another man and bring the man to the man? No, he created woman. Don't come to me with that foolishness about culture, what society say. It's not about what society say. It's about what the Lord said. 
and then in covenant relationship with God and doing what God say do. We want blessings, but we want blessings to sweep over disobedience. No, God ain't going to continue to bless you if you're being disobedient. Yeah. This might sound like a little rough, but we need a little rough rider every now and then. God will not sweep over disobedience just to bless you. Give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me that. No, what are you giving God? How are you sacrificing for God? How are you putting God first? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. We cannot continue to be disobedient and expect God to bless us. Now let me put this in your basket tonight. Why do you think the world is in the condition that it is? Simply, we've gone away from God. We disrespected the law of truth, the Torah, the Bible. We doing whatever is pleasing in our own eyes and not doing according to the eyes of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. God is not asleep. He neither sleep nor slumber. No, you're not getting by. God just is long suffering. And when the inevitable come knocking on our door, we blame God and say, uh, Guess what happened? That's the way God loves us? No, it's not a point. Of God loving us, it's a point of us loving God. Covenant relationship. Life is a journey, not a destiny. We're centrally located in, in Beaumont, Texas, and and Beaumont, Texas, uh, uh, Houston, Texas is west of us and New Orleans is east of us. And it depends on what journey you get on, what direction depends on where you end up. You can't leave here going west and end up in New Orleans. You can't leave here going east and end up in Houston. If you stay on the right journey, you'll wind up. It'll automatically take you to your destiny. And it doesn't matter how you leave, how you stay on the journey. If you're walking, if you're crawling, if you're on a tricycle, if you're on a scooter, if you're on a bicycle, if you're in a car, it doesn't matter. If you stay on the journey, it will definitely lead you automatically to the destiny. You don't have to worry about getting to heaven. Just stay on the journey. Just stay in covenant relationship with God. It ought to, you will automatically learn, lean, and be dependent on celestial shores. Then the last thing is, is that we have to pursue and promote God's word. Pursue God's word. Now, we're hungry for a lot of things, but... I don't know if we're hungry for the word of God. How many times do you eat a day? How many times do you snack a day? How many times do you read God's word a day? Did I say that? You caught big and gravy licking right. We need to keep the knowledge of God. And people ought to seek what thus said the Lord. Why is the world in disturbance why it is? Why, 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 why are people so in melancholy like it is? Why, why, why people, you, they, they don't have no foundation. They, they just all over the place. It's because they don't have no peace. And the reason they don't have no peace, they don't have no covenant relationship with God. And the reason they don't have no covenant relationship with God is because they don't have a word. Walk with me right, right quick to uh, Galatians 5 and 22. I almost went back to Bible study when I was a little boy when it said attention draws sword and cover. Galatians 5 and 
and 22. The answer is in the principle in relationship and job. Galatians 5 and 22. But the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, in covenant relationship with God, the fruit of being in covenant relationship with God is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. That's the fruits of a covenant relationship with God. Don't worry about what the fruits, what the fruits are if you're not in covenant relationship with God. If you're not in covenant relationship with God, I don't have to tell you, you already get known. Help me, Lord Jesus. God give life and God give peace. He said we have to remain shown to the Torah. Let me give you these words of this song about lift him up and that I'll be through. The world is hungry for the living bread. Lift the Savior up for them to see. Trust in him and do not doubt the words that he said. He said I'll draw all men unto me. How to reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. I think I need to say that again. How to reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, not the Senate, for the answer. Not the House of Representatives, for the answer. Not the governor. For the answer, not the city council, for the answer, Jesus gave the key. And he said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, good book, good book, I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up? Yes, lift him up. Lift him up till he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, he'll draw all men unto me. Remain in covenant relationship with God on this journey and you will automatically wind up on Celeste show. Beep, 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 beep. That's all, folks. We'll see you next Tuesday night.